All right, let's get started. Um, oh, he took it away. Uh, I was going to point to the, the figure that said he had 118 slides to get through. But, <laughs> Don't tell him they'll be leaving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to the EOL seminar, everybody. Uh, today's speaker is John Hubbard. John got his PhD in electrical engineering from Colorado State University in the study of uh, radar polarimetry. He came to NCAR in 2002. That puts you at about that 15 year mark, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and nearly all of the time since, he has uh, been the PI, the leader, the manager of the NextRad data quality project. Today he's gonna tell us about a, a breakthrough that he's made in the calibration of radar differential reflectivity. John. Thanks, Mike, for that introduction. So that's right, we'll talk about the precise calibration. I thought maybe that, it's hard to come up with a catchy title for calibration, you know, I thought maybe precise would make people interested what John's up to. Uh, I should probably thank people for a lot of this material I could not have done without the support of the RSF staff. Uh, Mike Dixon, for example, he did a lot of the signal processing and made possible a lot of those plots. And of course, there is my, my mentor and my PhD advisor, Dr. Bringy. We have him in the audience also. So now I have to be very careful about what I say because he may <laughs> correct me. So <laughs> not too much. Okay, so let's, uh, let's jump into this area. Let's go through a little bit of history first. Where did GDR come from? Of course, it was introduced, I'll just to remind people, I'm sure most of you realize that, but in 76 by Seligan and Bringy in their groundbreaking uh, uh, jam paper. And there is, a, there is a copy of that paper right there, the, the, the front of it. Um, and they, what they realized was that as raindrops become uh, oblate, they, be, uh, they become more oblate the larger they get. And here's a little cartoon of, of these uh, oblate raindrops. So they realized that with, if you could measure ZDR, and that ZDR is a ratio of the horizontal to vertical reflectivity, you can make an estimate of that DM, that uh, mass weighted mean diameter of a drop size distribution. If you could estimate another parameter of the uh, exponential drop size distribution, you should be able to make better rain rate estimates. And so they came up with this paper, and if you want to know the details about that, you can ask Bringy. I think they struggled a little bit to get that uh, to get that published because there was a lot of people that didn't quite believe in that to begin with. Um, the first measurements were, were made in 1977 by the uh, Chill Radar, based in Illinois at that time. They are doing an experiment in Oklahoma, and that's really kind of the birth of of, of, of weather radar. Uh, interestingly, you know, the Canadians, namely McCormick and Hendry, they were using circular uh, polarization in 1975. They had, had this paper here, the principles of radar determination of the polarization properties of precipitation. So uh, along the same line, that was in radio science, but why, so why, why not use circular polarization instead of HV? Because obviously we didn't go that route, did we? Well, as it turns out, there's cross-coupling upon propagation when you use circular polarization. And Bringy and Dushan Zernick, uh, and Bringy, you can correct me, realized this, and I think they wrote a letter to the uh, National Weather Service and said, you may want to you know, reconsider you know, using circular polarization and use you know, horizontal and vertical polarization. I believe that's correct. So 1976, well, that was a long time ago. First Star Wars movie, can you believe that? Human accomplishments since 1976. Personal computer revolution, human genome map, cosmic string theory was introduced in 76 by Thomas Kibble. The internet, there was no internet back then. GPS navigation, cell phones, but what can't we do well yet? But 40 years later, we are still trying to calibrate that, bringing us your fault, ZDR thing. <laughs> So this is, I love, I've shown this at several conferences, so there's beating the ZDR horse to the death there, trying to get a calibrated ZDR out of it. Well, let's start off with basics here. What is calibration? It's, it's in measurement technology and metrology. It is a comparison of measurement values delivered by a device under test, and of course that's our radar, with those of a calibration standard of known accuracy, and that's, of course, that's the catch, right? You've got to have a calibration standard of known accuracy, not just 
of a known mean value, but also of an accuracy, of an uncertainty. That's important to understand in all this. Uh, such a standard could be another measurement device of known accuracy, a device generating a quantity to be measured, et cetera, et cetera. So ZDR, we should understand, is a pretty demanding measurement. Radar receivers have about a 90 dB dynamic range. That's one to, you know, one billion. H and V powers, over this 90 dB range, we want to we wanna measure down to a tenth of a dB. That's about 2.3%. You have issues when you have, if you had something that would give you, give you a known ZDR value, you have to worry about things like side lobes, receiver saturation, multipath reflections, ray domes, wet ray domes, RF interference, and there can just be malfunctioning electronics because these radars are very complex devices. A lot of times something can go wrong and your color PPI still looks good, but there's something going on in the background that you can't pick up a tenth or a couple tenths of a dB with your eyeball. And so, but importantly, what makes ZDR measurements and the calibration difficult is a lack of accurate and readily available, available measurement standard. So there's insufficient data. There's a dearth of accurate, verifiable, good time resolution calibration data over an extended period of time. And so there's no data. And so you're like looking in the dark here. If you have good data to look at, how can you make a real evaluation of ZDR? Of course, the gold standard for ZDR calibration is vertical pointing data in, in light rain. And this has been used, this is used by many radars yet. It's good because it's an end-to-end -end measurement Right, it calibrates the whole system. It fills up the radar beam. That's important that you have whatever your standard is, it covers the whole radar beam. And uh, it can be executed over a relatively short time, so that's good also. And, but, you know, there's that one measurement, and we have faith in that measurement, but how do we really know? Is it, isn't it really, wouldn't it be nice if you had another standard that you can compare to it to be sure? So we just, we've really just taken that on faith as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. So the vertical pointing technique issues is like, how many revolutions do you integrate? Over here is a cartoon out of Gorguchi et al. 1999. And here is ZDR going from zero up to like three tenths of a dB. Um, and, is these, and this is the azimuth angle. And you can see as it's vertically pointing, look at those, look at those gyrations. And you see that with most radar, I would say all radars, that with ray domes. And so what exactly causes that? Are we sure that when you integrate over all these things that you're going to end up with a mean value of ZDR? That's zero dB. We've taken that on faith also. And so um, you only, so the limitations here are important because this, this is what's going to be different in my presentation. One can only execute the vertical pointing data when there is light rain over the radar. As it turns out, if you have a very deep uh, snowstorm, you can do, do it also. But it is more difficult. Light rain is best. Uh, so this makes it very difficult to, demo to, uh, to uh, uh, document ZDR bias variability over long time periods with good temporal resol re revolution, uh, resolution. I mean, you don't know of very many. And when I say it's got to be, you know, let, you have better than 10 minute updates and something that would go on like maybe for eight hours or go on for multiple days. So you can see, you know, what's, what's happening with ZDR. Well, there is a technique out there that, we, that allow us to do that. It's not very well known, unless you've been listening to me talk over the past 10 years. Uh, there is this paper with uh, myself and Bringy and Brunkow, published in 2003, where we established the cross-polar power technique. It uses precipitation clutter targets uh, coming in the main lobe or from side lobes, as it turns out. I'll talk to that in a minute. And then it also uses solar scans. And using those two measurements, using solar scans and then precipitation or clutter targets, you can do the calibration as it turns out. And what's nice is that these are available any time during daylight hours. So you can do repeated measurements. So here's the essence of the cross-polar power technique. Here's, here's a scattering matrix just showing that the incident electric field hits the scatterers, and this is the reflected electric field. And these two cross terms, as it turns out by radar reciprocity are equal. And that's the crux of it. So if, cross, if the cross polar powers that you actually measure with your radar are not equal, then there is a differential path gain imbalance that can be exploited to calibrate ZDR. So, so that's it. It's a very simple method. And 
uh, uh, there are reasons why this is not used, and, and I can go into that later. But uh, obviously, I'm, I'm advocating that you should do that to really understand your radar. So I, I'll, I will hit you over the head with a few simple algebraic equations. Is that, they're actually quite simple. Um, here is a here is just a block diagram of S pole starting off with the H and V powers, it goes through circulators, out wave guides, to the antenna gains, here are the scatterers, the H and V you know, powers out there that you're going to, you're going to, to get a hold of. Um, it comes back into the circulator, you have the two LNAs, we have an IF switch, so that the copolar signal is always going to the copolar receiver and the cross-polar signal is going to go to the cross-polar receiver. So by sim this captures the things that can um, uh, vary, vary in, in, in ZDR calibration. And so I wanted to show this because this shows the things that you, you have to be cognizant of. You're going to have transmit power differences that can make biases. Here, here's the waveguide, here are the antenna guides that can you know, cause a, a, a ZDR bias. Here's the receiver. This, and I'm representing that whole path here by the circulator and the LNA. And then you can have the gain of the two receivers also that, that can affect it. And then, um, that's not correct. Excuse me, I should take that out. This was a, an, another slide that I had written from my, um, my course, and that, that should not be in there. So just ignore that, those two terms right there. And then there, and then there is this um, uh, term that's, that, that accounts for this um, uh, um, IF switch. But anyway, so these are the bias terms, and you fundamentally have a transmit portion, an antenna portion, and a receiver portion. As it turns out, this IF switch doesn't really, doesn't really affect the uh, um, the, the, the calibration, and, and we have data to show that explicitly. But this is, the, this is what we'd like to get our hands on. That thing, so we'd like to eliminate those and get our hands on those guys. So here's the, here's the set of equations that I will use throughout the rest of the paper. So you have to look at them at least once. And this is the ZDR calibration equation. It says that ZDR, and that will be calibrated, is the measured ZDR times this S1, S2, that's solar power ratios. And S1, S2 is, as you receive that sun energy, it's a ratio of, the, the, uh, of a V copolar by H copolar sun power, because you have those four different paths in there. And it's a V cross polar by H cross polar uh, uh, power also. So there is the ZDR calibration equation, and here is this is the cross ratio of the cross polar powers. You go through that circuit diagram that I showed you. This is you can easily in five minutes copy down what that is, and this is and then there's S1, S2. Go to that diagram, and so you can go ahead and convince yourself that when you multiply this times this by what I showed in the previous diagram is that everything cancels out and you will be left with, let me go to the, um, uh, where does it say the last previous right there? You'll end up with simply this intrinsic value and all these, all those terms will go away. Well, good, so that, that's how the thing works. And there's one other thing that you, that's nice to know about is that you can take the cross polar powers and you can subtract off the transmit power ratio as you see, the transmit power ratio is in, is in that cross-polar power ratio. And once you do that, you're left with just the receiver gain ratio. So this will help us to track down our ZDR variation that we're going to see now in slides. OK, let's go back in time. 2007, you know, the ROC, I should have uh, acknowledged the Radar Operations Center of, uh, of Norman, Norman, Oklahoma, because they have funded this research for, uh, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, are funded, funded our data quality group. And so at that time, we thought that the antenna was a constant gain device. It was just made out of metal. And so we took, and this purple line represent test pulses injected at that test plane above the LNAs. And then here is an equivalent signal coming from the solar ratio. And we, we thought that those things should match up. And they weren't matching up. And we never could quite figure out what was going on there. And then our funding plug got pulled. So we didn't look at it, <laughs> didn't look at it anymore. So that just kind of stick a pin in it. And, and, and uh, we kind of forgot about that from 2007 until a few years ago. 
Um, so just remember that. I'll come back to that slide later on. It's kind of interesting. Um, I, I like to mention uncertainty because no calibration is really complete unless you can specify. Here's, here's ZDR calibrated and you take the measured ZDR and then you correct it for the bias. And, but then you have this delta. And so what is delta? It's the uncertainty of the bias measurement. And you don't see that very often reported about what the, what the uncertainty is of, of those measurements. People talk about that to that, but you did seldom see data where they can really justify that rigorously. How big is it? Well, we'd like to have it to be a tenth of a dB with about 95% confidence, I would say. Maybe even more than that. And how does one estimate it? If I have time, I'll get into that. This is a, if you thought this was dry, this even gets drier. So uncertainty, again, you, you normally evaluate it with repeated measurements. And theory says these things, these measurements should make a Gaussian distribution. Here is the mean value, the ZDR bias. Hopefully, you have a measurement standard like vertical pointing data. And so you know what that term is. And then here's the delta. And here's a, they call that a coverage factor. So let's, that's good enough for that. And if I have time, I'll come back to that. So we said we had to measure those uh, solar power ratios. Well, here, here is some software, uh, for the results from which Mike Dixon made. We can make um, you know, pseudo an antenna patterns. Here is the H and V patterns. You take and you scan, the, uh, you scan the sun. And then you actually can take and difference those two patterns. And you end up with. Uh, uh, the, uh, what I call a ZDR pattern, and if it turns out if you square it, you end up with a, basically you square it, you end up with this S1, S2 pattern that we have to measure in our calibration equation. And what we do, this is a one degree uh, solid angle, and this is a two degree solid angle. We have found that just integrating over this one degree solid angle, coming up with a single number for S1, S2 is sufficient to make good ZDR calibration. So there, so we measured that. So here, this is the way we go ahead and do that. Um, and, and to save time, I guess I'll skip over that. But we basically scan it, and then we put it onto a one a tenth of a degree, a tenth of a degree grid. And then there's some interpolation. You've got to count for the sun movement and, and all that to come up. So it, it's, not, it's not a straightforward thing. There's a little bit of thought that has to go into that. The cross-polar power ratio, here's an, here's an example of those types of measurements. Here is one cross-polar power versus another cross-polar power. You can see that's over about 80 dB here or so. And they should equal each other. And so that's as good. They're lying upon a one-to-one -one line. If you're looking at 80, 90 dB, though you can't see small variations in the difference there. And so you, you can bin these up into, I think I did that into two dB bins, and then and plot plot that, you know, the, the uh, one of the cross-polar power ratios, you know, versus this, uh, 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 versus this, this sum like this. And then you can see these, um, these variations. And so this is, you know, low down on the calibration curve. So you're, you know, maybe noise effects here, and this is higher up. So that would represent, so you got to be taking, these are the kind of little details you have to take care of. So this would represent receiver saturation. So we typically just take this data from the good part of the receiver to make the calculation of the, of the cross polar power ratio. Okay. What is that ratio on dB? I can't quite read it. Okay, sorry. Let me go back. Which one? This ratio right here, yeah. 0. 0.78. 0. 0.78. So it's just, it represents a, it represents a, well, I showed you that CPR equation. It represents a, uh, an offset that has to do with the radar, 0. 0.78 dB. It's, it's one of the calibration numbers that we're going to have to use. But you see it doesn't vary too much there over, over this range over this uh, uh, you know, 40, 50 dB range here or more. It, you know, here is, you know, here is 0.78 and here is 0.74. So we're talking about you know, a half of a tenth of a dB. So it's you know, pretty good measurement. Average a lot of data, over 12,000 points. OK. So along came the MassGrad experiment in 2014 to 2015, a winter experiment in the Colorado Front Range where we had our radar at the place we called Front. And what was nice here is that there were large diurnal temperature swings. 
and we did many solar scans. And largely because of my of this next rad project that I'm involved in. So this was the first experiment that I am aware of that there were so many solar scans were made and this brought to light the variations in the ZDR bias. And so this is what we started to see. This is just for a single day. This is on uh, January 15th, 2015. So these are in hours here from 15 out to 23 hours. So this is the, the majority of the day. So here in the solid curve is temperature on the right side going from minus 8 up to 14 C. And here is S1, S2 varying down here from about 0.7 uh, 73 dB up to uh, you know 0.9 dB, and so that was kind of puzzling because we didn't really expect to see that. So we were, what's going on? Is something wrong with the radar? First thing you think is maybe something wrong with the radar. But lo and behold, data gathered from December 24th, 26th, January 9, 10, 11, 12, over all these days, and here is a scatter plot of S1, S2 versus the temperature, and so there is something going on with the radar. The correlation coefficient is, 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 0 .9, is 0 0.9 and S1, S2, if you fit a regression curve to it, you end up with this guy here. And about a slope of 0 .0082 you know, uh, dB per degree centigrade. So that was, that was interesting. It was consistent. So we knew there were some phenomena that we weren't really uh, accounting for. And of course, what you really want to know is what's causing this, what's causing this. So we can go we can go through some some numbers here, and the one thing that you can do is you can take a look at the ratio of the H co so that you have this this solar power coming in, all right. And this is over this is for January fifteenth over that same time period, <clears throat> and divided by H cross, and I'll I'll pop up a figure, and so this this is just the measure of the stability of the IF switch and the RVP8, the, the receiver. And you can do that not only for the solar powers, but also for the test pulse, because we have test pulses this time. And then we also had, had another V, V by V co, V cross uh, solar power. So notice how flat these are and how good agreement they are. And so from this, Here's that circuit diagram. In other words, you take the H solar power that comes in here. So we're taking the ratio of this path to this path. So we're looking at the variability of this guy here. And, and this, was, this was like the same thing for about every day. And so from that, we can say, well, that variation that I showed you before is not coming from that part of the radar receiver. The other thing you can look at is the cross-polar power ratio. Remember that the cross-polar power ratio is a function of the transmit powers measured at the, and I'll say measured at the reference plane. And this is the receiver right here, this H, H circulator in the LNA that represents that. that um, and you can see that the cross-polar powers are a direct function of the transmit powers. And here is a plot of the cross-polar power in a solid line. And these should be the same scale. And here is the V by H transmit power. And you can see how the cross-polar power, how nicely it tracks and is dominated by the transmit power. And what that means, you're not getting a lot of variation out of this part of the part. And that's important. That's important. So you can take now that cross-polar power ratio and subtract off. This is the transmit power ratio. And so you're just left with the receiver. and this shows the cross-polar power ratio, and this dotted line now represents the, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, the um, uh, the difference of the uh, uh, of the transmit power and the cross uh, cross-polar power ratio, and that's so this dotted line is just this receiver gain, and you can see this is about three hundredths of a dB, so the and it's flat. Remember, we saw on this day, we saw this increase in nearly two-tenths of a dB. So we know that it's not the, it's not, it's not the receiver then. So we can say it's not the receiver that's causing this, causing this rise in ZDR bias. By the way, 0.3 dB is about a 0.7% variation. So this is 300ths of a dB. That is precious little in terms of a big radar like SPOL. OK, so there is that cross-polar power ratio. Transmit power, the receiver gain, as I have been preaching here. And so knowing this now, 
we know that it's not has anything to do with the gain proper of the radar and we from before we has nothing to do with that and so what we were left with here's s1 s2 and then we needed to know that because that's what an s1 s2 is not only a function of the antenna gain in the waveguide but it's also a function of the receivers but now we know it has, has nothing to do with that and we are left with that's the culprit. Something is going on with the antenna and possibly the waveguides going out to the antenna. So that's what's causing the increase. Why? That's another, another issue. So it doesn't come from the LNAs to the RBP8 receivers, mostly results from the reference plane out to the antenna. But we, as I showed, we are, there are some of, of the transmit power was rising up a little bit and that's in there also. And so here's that, here, so here's that single day, the 15th, which is a nice illustrative case. And so here is the ZDR bias. It changes about two-tenths of a dB over that day. Here is the S1-S2 ratio. It increases by about 0.15 dB. Here is the cross-polar power ratio, added one so that it could be on the same scale. And there's the rest of the variation. And so we see that there's about 75% of the bias from that day comes from, from the antenna. Okay, so we packed up our antenna, our, our radar, and we went to Pecan. Now at this point of the previous slide, there's only about one person that believed in this. And you can imagine who that one person was. Because they hadn't seen that before. We never calibrated, you know, we always, the antenna, and there was a very famous uh, radar meteorologist that said, you calibrate the uh, antenna, and then, I won't say what his name is, but he's, he's a Serbian. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. No offense, to, no offense to that area of the world. Okay, so let's go to PECON data because this is where it gets to be actually more interesting. I'm sorry I had to go through all that dry stuff, but if you don't get that, then it's hard to justify all this stuff here. So it was a nice experiment. It's a nice data set because there were solar scans. We had VP data. There was no VP data in the wintertime because these winter storms are typically never deep and just we didn't really have any good VP data and the ones we had had so much variability, you couldn't tell what's going on. Uh, they always can have cross-polar power data. There were large temperature swings there also. Um, uh, the actual, we actually went ahead and put temperature probes onto the antenna itself, so we measured not just the ambient temperature, but the temperature of the antenna. So then we, we, had, the right, we had the right parameter in there. We also have some Bragg data we can compare to, and the radar was operating continuously during this time, and I, was, I had to argue a little bit, but I was able to get enough solar scan data in there which people didn't really believe in at the time, so that I could do this cross-polar power technique to see what the heck was going on. All right, S1, S2 for pecan. What's funny here? It, it switched signs. This didn't bode well for me because everybody then said, Hubbard doesn't know what he's talking about. Look at that, why, why would it change sign like that? But there it is, you know. It, but, but it, and it's just basically the reciprocal, you know. It just went from minus, minus to plus, if that's a reciprocal. And so, so that was odd, but it was very consistent. This is, you know, this is 0.56, up to it's just a couple of tenths of a dB there, so it's very, very highly correlated. And... Um, is that the atmospheric temperature or the temperature of the dish itself? It should be the temperature of the dish itself. Yeah, it says dish there, so I'm, I'm sure it is. There wasn't really much difference, except right in the middle of the day when it was the hottest, and then the dish could actually be, you know, two to three C higher than than that, and, that, and that's all. So you, as it turns out, at least for these numbers, you know, you could have done well with the ambient temperature. And so there you go. I got to explain that somehow now. We got <laughs> we got to go on this way and then go on that way. Okay, we'll talk about that later. So this is what's nice about the s pole stability during pecan. So it started on June 1, and we had a lot of problems with s pole during those first couple of weeks. We had air conditioning problems. We had uh, trigger amp problems. Oh, gosh, what else? We, did, we, we had uh, some electronic components fail that was hard for us to identify. So it really wasn't until about, it, it just starts here from the 22nd, but it was around June 16th when the data became rather stable. And I like this diagram because if 
I would, if I were to do another radar experiment, this is the types of plots you want to look at to see if your radar is healthy. And so these are all the important parameters you need. So over here is the temperature scale, and this is the how the temperature varied over that time period. Here is the transmit power ratio. It's highly correlated. I don't take my word for it going through there. And what we have figured out that there was probably an AC problem. We weren't having that temperature stable enough. Even though this is the outside temperature, all of this is inside. But there was air conditioners, and there's something to do with the cycling of the air conditioning and, and uh, the transmit power network. Down here is the cross polar power as varying. And then here is the difference between the cross polar power ratio and that transmit power ratio. And this, remember, is the LNA fluctuations. There are other electronic components in there, but for brevity, I'll just blame it all onto the LNA. So again, this is about 0.03 dB, and that's pretty good. You know, over, over, over a month's time, and this is all your receiver is going to vary, operating 24-7. That's very good. And, so, and this is why we were able to really kind of nail down things in, in this experiment. So let's move forward here. And so let's go back here. The re remember the radar receiver gain stability. Oh, I wanted to remind people that this, as it turns out, this radar receiver gain stability is going to be quite important for this cross polar power technique. And that here is the cross polar power ratio. Here is the recirculators and the LNAs, S1, S2. Here is the reciprocal of the of, of these two guys, and these, these, this term has to cancel with one of, one of these terms. This is squared. And, and when you measure the cross-polar power ratio, and then when you measure S1, S2, this has to be a stable number, because if they vary from this measurement to whenever you do this measurement, then they don't cancel. But as I showed before, th those LNAs, those are very stable, only 300 of a dB, and that's how come we can, this is how come we're going to do what I'm going to show you next, and why, why this cross polar power uh, technique works so well. So here's what we did for pecan. Here's the equation again, calibrated, the measured, sun solar power ratio, the uh, transmit power ratio. So you calculate S1, S2 from the regression curve. You don't have to have a solar power measurement right during the calibration period. You can use that regression curve. And then because you have known dish temperatures, because we measured those. And those are highly correlated, those numbers. Temperatures in S1, S2. You calculate CPR from the PPI and RHI data. And that's all the time, right? Just during the experiment, we can go ahead from every, every uh, PPI volume scan and every RHI volume scan, you can calculate a cross polar power ratio. And then your correction factor, which is this stuff here, you can calculate that from, from those two numbers, and boom, you've got a good ZDR calibration number that takes into account the temperature variation of your dish now. That's the correction factor. And, of course, because you're using this regression curve, ZDR can be calibrated both day and night now. So you don't need to measure this. Obviously, you can't measure the solar thing during night, but you don't need to, as long as your system is stable. OK, this is the ZDR calibration curve for pecan. Looks a little different than what we're used to at, at NCAR. This goes from down here, that's about uh, uh, you know, minus 0.2 dB, up to a little over 0.05 dB. So a little better than 2 tenths of a dB, 3 tenths of a dB across this thing. So you can just see these. it's just a function of the temperature. Of course, it varies as the temperature varies. Compare that to our legacy calibration, what we would have done. If we just used vertical pointing data, we would have said, well, you know, those points don't make sense in this one. We got the majority here around there. That's probably a good estimate of the ZDR calibration. And that's the way we would have calibrated it before. July 10th, the temperatures were lower there, I believe. If we went back to the, the uh, these, uh, 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 let's see, let's see. Pre well, let me see if I probably go use this, so use this up arrow here. The ratio also uh, kind of flattened out. So yeah, well, right here. This is what happened. Look at the temperature. When the temperature was cool, Inside the trailer, everything was much happier, less fluctuation there, and then less fluctuation down there, because it just reflects this, this, um, this variation there. So what's the moral of that story? Fix our air conditioners.
I, ha I have an in interesting story about that, but I won't go into it now. Okay, so, uh, so we know, now we know we better get our air conditioners fixed. All right, so there's how we're calibrating it now. Interesting. And this was, I did this, and I still, I'll have to say, many people in RSF did not want to buy into this stuff. What's, what's your problem, Inchao? I believe you. You believe me? Okay. <laughs> where, where were you a year ago? I funded the <laughs> Okay, so my little cartoons here is that, you know, when you do something, how about it's the same problem? Well, you did that. Well, maybe that's right. So this is, we do some comparisons. And so, thank goodness, we have vertical pointing data, and then we also had nice brag scatter data during this experiment to compare it to. Here and here is the vertical pointing data, right here. Temperature versus that VP ZDR bias, and take a look at the curve here, and notice that there, here, you know, we're around a, around a hundredth of a dB like we were before. People still didn't believe me, so <laughs> so so we had to do more. We had to do more. So there there, there were cracks. There were cracks in the. Uh, in their edifice, they were breaking down at this point. So anyway, so here is the date, here is the cross-polar power technique, uh, uh, the bias, and here is the bias and the vertical pointing technique, here is the difference, and you take a look at these differences, we're down you know, in the hundredth of a dB range. So look at that, it's really remarkable how well those, you know, even I didn't know how well they're gonna agree, and that's why I was pretty pleased, obviously, when these things agreed so well. And, the, and then there's more to this, you know. Here's the 14th. Remember, this is before the, the period of stability of our radar system. So this kind of outside it. I was able to put that point in there. So what was I able to do? Well, there was data, S1, S2 data from June 13th to 14th. And there is the data. I guess there are seven, eight points there. Here is a plot of them. Here is I did the regression curve. So here is the vertical pointing ZDR bias measured. And if I use the previous regression curve, not this one, but the previous front, you'd see there's a quite a bit, you know, relatively quite a bit of disagreement there. But using the regression curve from that, from those points on those days, minus 0.123, minus 1.42. So when you do this time and time again, it starts to lend, you know, some, some confidence in all that. We had one longer set of vertical pointing data that went over nearly an hour. And here is the cross-polar power ZDR bias. Here is minus 0.06 to 0.06 dB, okay, the ZDR bias. And here are the hours, one hour worth of data. And, in, and the dotted line is the temperature profile. And it's from 18 to 24 degrees C. And so obviously because it, CP is a function of, of the temperature, it's not, it's not earth shaking that of course CP tracked that because it goes into the calculation. But the solid line are the individual one 360 degree revolution from vertical pointing data. And what's interesting here is that, you know, this is the transition period and, and look at the how much variation there is in that vertical pointing data. And then when we get down here to a more temperature stable period, how smooth they become. And though obviously I can't prove it, I believe that the shape of that antenna is transitioning in some irregular way so that these these VP ZDR bias numbers are varying that much. If you look at the, it's the histograms, the histograms look fine. There's, no, there's nothing that would say that, oh, we got some outliers or something's wrong with that data. Everything looks fine. And so this is, this is quite interesting that you can see the vertical pointing data once again, you know, agreeing with what we're seeing with the cross polar power technique. So I thought that was a very pr powerful plot. How are we doing for time here anyway? Oh, I got plenty of time. Bragg, you're not done yet. Bragg scatter comparison. Um, you know we don't see all that much brag here in the front range because it's just too damn dry. And so when the rock started looking at brag scatter, I thought they were a little bit nuts maybe because I never, I didn't see that much brag scatter here. But now with S pole as in that was in Kansas, um, you, you see you can see a lot of brag scatter on a regular basis. And so um, uh, what's the elevation angle on this? Uh, I think that says is that uh, one degree I guess. Not 100% sure on that. I, had, I had just had a retina operation, and so one of my eyes is not very good 
so I really don't see that well. Um, and here is the corresponding Z. So low values is Z, and here are these Bragg scatter. The, the gray things are right around zero dB. So I just, this is just kind of interesting. I think that may be a 10 degree angle. So this is, um, and the bugs with very, very high ZDR, these are gonna be around you know, eight, nine, 10, even 14 dB from the bugs uh, from, from pecan. And here is an RHI. So, and, and it's known that the Bragg scatter kind of rides on top of the, of the boundary la layer here, and this is where the bugs like to hang out. So that's what Bragg scatter looks like. So ZDR from Bragg should be zero dB. So let's go ahead and now do some comparisons there. So we, uh, uh, Mike came up with this little bit of an algorithm to uh, automatically identify um, Bragg scatter. That's not so interesting, but we, we went in. So here, here is the automatically identified Bragg scatter from the 21st through about the 4th of July. This had a lot of good cases in there. And there, there's a lot of variance there. And, and as it turns out, there is variance in these Bragg estimates going from about um, you know, minus, uh, you know, minus a tenth up to two tenths of a dB. But most of the data does, you know, come in around this value. It looks like there's a positive bias on that, and I believe that's some insect scatter that leaks through into the measurement. And so th th there was reasonable agreement, and so what, but what I did is I went through and I visually identified what we th I thought were the best brag, where there's a lot of brag scatter, there weren't any clouds, uh, um, uh, they were thick in, in a large extent, so you could get good estimates of it, because you have these little thin, dotty, Bragg scatter regions, it's hard to get a, a good estimate. And so from these areas in oval, you can see if you average the data in that time, they're coming out very close to zero dB. This data was corrected using the cross polar power technique. But then, I, then there was this outlier, which I considered an outlier. It's, it's, I wanted to get this within 500 of a dB, and this is out at, out at 700 of a dB, and that was on about the 21st. So I didn't quite know what to think about that, but you, you probably know what I'm going to do. You just go and you look at some of these solar scans that are around that day and make a regression curve using those data points from that day. Here is the old regression curve used for the whole experiment, okay? And using solar data close to the time of your meteorological measurements will, will yield you the best calibrations. And so here is that same Bragg data. This is a before. And here is an after, and so you can see we pushed this up, you know, now under five hundredths of a dB, you know, up to a hundredth of a dB, and it puts it in better agreement again. So that's another, that's another indication of how well this technique can work. So then we go back to this question about why haven't we observed this temperature dependence before? And all these years, 19, mid, in the middle of the 1990s, right? ESPO was out making measurements. Why? What was going on there? Well, so we were able to go back into one data set, Dynamo. And here is the Dynamo vertical pointing data. Get the date, the time. Here's the temperature degrees, number of gates. And this is the mean number that we like to use. And then we like to do the mean, median, and standard deviation for data quality purposes. But you take a look at the, the temperature in degree C, and you see it doesn't, doesn't vary. So it wasn't varying, so we didn't see it. And so if you go and you plot that, you know, we had swaps, we swapped out the fast polarization switch at these dotted line times. So you take a look at this time, all these data points in here, and this, you know, 0.28 up to 0.32. So that's why we didn't see it, because it wasn't there. And then if you had probably, and I'm just surmising this, if there were other experiments with more temperature variation, we might have just where racked. That, where was that experiment? Oh, I'm sorry. It was Dynamo, and that was on the equator in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so it wasn't a lot. Of, you wouldn't expect a lot of temperature variation either. But it's nice to, nice to verify that. Nice to verify that. Um, and of course, when you do vertical pointing made data, it's always cloudy, it's raining over the radar, and so that kind of mitigates the temperature too, so it, it, it evens it out. So you wouldn't expect a lot of temperature variation. Okay, now, so what is the physical cause of this temperature dependence? And there's, I don't have a real solid answer, but I, we pretty much narrowed it down to the antenna. Does it make much sense that it's in the waveguide? You wouldn't expect much there. And so that here are the struts, and here is the antenna support system. And of course, one way to look at the field 
the, um, the, electric, electric, the electric field in the far field is that it's just a sum of these various sinusoids that are reflected off the dish. And so that as the dish would heat up, let's say, the struts expand. So you change this dish, the distance in here. And then you also, the shape of the dish is going to change. And so that the phase relationship amongst all these waves that combine in the far field you know, are, are, are what's causing the, um, the bias variation. I, I'm pretty sure about that. I'd say I'm like 98% there. Um, how are we doing on time here? 45, OK. Here's a couple more interesting things here. Um, and so we, are, we, we knew from going to Dynamo that 2800 was a better frequency to operate at than 2809, because you had a nicer ZDR pattern. And so I went out there with, I believe Rich Ice and I went out there that day, and we took this data by simply varying the, 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 uh, um, the re receiver frequency from 20, 2798 up to 2805. And each one of these breaks here represents a solar scan. So we wanted to make sure that we did several solar scans to make sure that we we're making a consistent measurement. And so look at this scale. This is a time index, but it's, I don't know precisely the time, but we made this batch, then we measured this, and then we measured this. But anyway, here's this S1, S2 number, and this is 0.8 down to 0.55, and take a look at how much that changes as a function of, these, of the function of the frequency. So we still haven't explained this fully, but the idea here is that changes in dimension of the dish are somehow equivalent to changes in frequency. Uh, that, that you might be using the radar at. And what you can do is go ahead and take a look at the expansion contraction of the antenna, aluminum 6061. This is the expansion coefficient. The struts are about 18 feet long. For a 10 degree temperature change, you get about this, this, this times, put, put, plug the numbers in, you come up with about one, just 1 1.29 millimeters. <laughs> Thus, this is on the same order of distance as as the 1.7. So, what is this? I, maybe I cut that slide. But if you jump in in one megahertz, say 2800 up to 2801, you will find that the 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 the, the difference in that waveform when it strikes the dish, which is over many, many wavelengths, is about 1.37 millimeters. So this is like saying the contraction of the dish, expansion of the dish, will give you dimensional change on the order of what is the same thing as you would see by equivalently changing the, um, 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 the, the, the frequency of the antenna. So it's, it's, it's a hand wave, but it's a, you know, I think it's reasonable. It's interesting that you know, such temperature changes are, are recognized in radio astronomy. And here, I just looked up this one article, even though it's a different thing, but from their abstract, they realize that thermal ex expansion of radio telescopes has long been recognized as an effect which cannot be neglected in geodetic and um, astrometric, very large scale. Um, yeah, what they said, what they said. Uh, data analysis, if millimeter accuracy is, uh, is, is desired. So other, other fields have recognized that. And I think we've been so involved with just getting Z and, and other less fine calibration that we're finally starting to realize that, you know, indeed, temperature has an effect on our system also. And so it's just not as full. Actually, so a lot of this research was spurred by this diagram over five days in December. This is it 2012? Maybe you can read that. And this is over the daylight hours. And this is what they're seeing with KOUN. This is the equivalent of an S1, S2. And that's about a tenth of a dB peak to peak. And so that you're, they're seeing these kind of sinusoidal swings there. So they're seeing some temperature variation. This is from the German, the DWD service couple of their radars in here at different pulse widths. And you can see there, here is the, what is that? There is the, there is the, um, um, the temperature, and there is the ZDR bias change. And the ZDR bias change, two tenths up to plus, that's four tenths of a dB. So they're seeing this temperature dependence also. Exactly what that is, they're not complete sure on, but everybody's taking a look at this effect now. And if you really want to, um, Calibrate your ZDR, your ZDR to within a tenth of a dB. These are the types of things you got to start looking at. And so um, I didn't update this, but I, there is this paper that just came out. 
I guess I said that in the beginning, right? It's just been accepted. You can go on to a JTAC and take a look at, to get all this material. It's all, it's all in there. So we're going to go back now to that discomforting plot of mass grad and, and uh, pecan data. So this is data from, um, from at the Espo Marshall Field site from April to June. Most of it was in April, and then there was another batch in June. And so we made a scatter plot here of this, of this S1, S2 estimate versus the site temperature. And indeed, around here at uh, 15 to 20 degrees, there is an inflection point there. And that's what we saw with the pecan and the mass grad data. So I would, I would not have been very confident of that before we saw this data, but that's pretty cool how that, uh, how that worked out now. Why is it the antenna keeps expanding? Why does the antenna keep expanding? It's just it's a function fu function of the temperature. Well, it's 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 a uh, it's a cyclical thing as it turns out. In fact, I'm I'm about out of time here, I believe. But now that you, and, and am I correct? I can't even see that clock over there. How much time do I have left before you guys fall asleep? Okay, let's go ahead here in time. Oh, let me get back. Remind me, I'm going to answer that question, but I saw this. This is another interesting slide here. Remember that first data set that I said was unexplained? That set off this, uh, this research topic? Well, here it is again, and I've re reformatted it. And here is the, here is the um, what I call the S1-S2 measurement from that data back in 207. Here is the equivalent S1-S2 for the receiver only. In other words, this is the test pulse data again here in the dotted line. And then here is, uh, that was in the dotted line. And then red line is the ambient temperature from over here. So this, looking at this part of the curve, look at the ambient temperature going up with the rise of S1, S2 in the solid line. And if you take a look at that, and you calculate the slope, it's about 0.08 dB, just like we were measuring today. So it, it always was there, and we just haven't. What's interesting here, we had the old feed horn, too. So apparently the feed horn doesn't affect it so much. So I thought that was cool. So let's go. We're having questions. We'll skip the conclusions. Uncertainty, that's boring. Let's go by that. S1, S2 in frequency. So here is, here, is an, here is an H and V pattern, I believe. That's H and that's V. So that's what they look like. And what we typically see here at operating frequency, the H is more circular, and this V is more oblong. OK? And so let's go ahead and just first take a look at this set of slides. This is at 20, I'll show you from 2798 megahertz, we're going to make one megahertz jump. And this is this S1, S2 pattern. And watch how the S1, S2 pattern changes. So there you go. So that shows how much that, in fact, does change. That was over a very short range. Now, uh, getting to your question, um, Mike Dixon, this is Mike Dixon's work in his words, but he came up with a way to make a measurement of the asymmetry of that V pattern to the H pattern. So he could kind of measure how this, because if you take a look on SID and just do a, um, um, a, a, a time series plot of these patterns, you can see these patterns going like this. They're wobbling back and forth. So we wanted to capture that with a number. So he came up with these two metrics to, to, to measure that. And, and this is what we see. So this is that it's basically that we're calling this that ZDR diff axis ratio, comparing the H to the V, and it's a sinusoidal, it's a sinusoidal phenomenon as you change frequency, as you might well think, because we are using sine waves, right? And so things just are, are cyclical. And this was a different way he calculated that. Here was the H to V correlation. I didn't say anything about that, but as it turns out, the H to V correlation coefficient looking at the sun is a function of that, is, is a function of the frequency. And here is the S1, S2. You don't see that nice sinusoidal variation here quite so much as you do in just that asymmetry uh, ratio. So did that answer your question? 
So they, that thing goes like that. It just, it, it just would, would is go, it's probably going to vary somewhat sinusoidally. We we believe, but you know, there's endless measurements that we could do to uh, you know, to verify this. But what we have done is that this is what I'm up to now, and that is we're going to do we're doing numerical modeling of the antenna using GRASP. That's the software package industry standard from TICRA, Netherlands company. And so we made measurements of the exact shape of the dish, and we know the exact shape of the struts, the feed horn, the waveguides on the back of it, and we have the exact feed uh, horn pattern that goes in there because I gave them the mechanical drawings for that feed horn. And this is, I made this back in 2009. Uh, there was a corporation called Geodetic and put a bunch of optical patches and at night you can make a you can make a, these are four, what did I say your 1400 optical patches on there to get the exact shape of the dish and so they're taking all this information now and running that method of moments and coming up so we're going to try to explain this and we've had mixed results I guess so far we're not we're not done with it so this is the initial analysis on the top row here at 2800 and 2805 and 2809 here is the ZDR pattern okay that S1 S2 or ZDR I guess that's S1 S2 and then here is the same thing from the uh, model data and we don't see quite the variation in there but you know if you take a look you look take a look in the center there is there is variation in there over this small uh, frequency range and down here you can see these 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 blues and grays are are getting down to be more negative and they, you see it becomes more and more negative and remember this is model data and this data here this data here comes from an antenna with a 0.93 beam width, 3 dB beam width, that's scanning a solar disk that subtends 0.53 degrees, so it's a convolution of those two things. So the next thing we would like to do is to take and take these theoretical modeled plots here and convolve them with the solar disk and then see how well these things, these things match up. So we're doing a lot of modeling and so, you know, we're certain that it has something to do with the antenna and so hopefully we can uh, you know, it's a very complicated thing and how far we can chase that, I'm, I'm not sure. But, and so here is the S1, S2. So we're seeing a lot of variation over there. You can see like a, upwards of a tenth of a dB and maybe more. And we're only getting like a half of a tenth of a dB when you integrate over that. So this is, we're not so sure what's going on here. That the model doesn't, is the model not capturing something? Obviously the model must not be capturing something that, you know, affects our antenna measurements. And what that exactly is, you know, we're not sure. Okay, we won't go into that because that's another another ten or fifteen minutes. So I'll, I will stop there, and that that would be a good question though. You could ask me that one from the next slide. I'll put that back up to prompt you. Thank you. No. You're, you're going to cut. You're the moderator. I'm sorry. I didn't want to step on your toes. There's one question back there. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get. Questions, but either, just one. Oh. Um, yeah. Let's uh, for. My question. No, your mic. Yeah. Let's use the the use microphone the for posterity and our online viewers. Oh, it's going to <clears throat> yes. <laughs> um, Recalibrate what you're going to say. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's still the same. Um, this was done with S pole, right? Yes. And so there's no radome. That's correct. So the, how will this does this translate into a uh, system that has a radome over it? That's the first question. Then I wonder also about phased array radars in the future, mm. electronically scanned, and mm. to what extent they will be affected. Mm. Well, for the first question, um, um, Yes, the rate we know it's there's enough data out there that we do know that the um, the radome affects our ZDR measurements. Uh, Rishkoff has done a little bit of measurements there. Uh, uh, Jorge Salazar 
He was a guy that was here for a while. He's hot into this area. And you do see that ZDR, especially as a function, he's, he's doing these things with radome wetting. And when you get the radome wet, you certainly do affect it. And that, that goes back to that plot that I showed you by Gorgucci in the very beginning, when you did that vertical pointing data, and you saw the ZDR as a function of azimuth angle. So we know that the radar, the dome affects it. In terms of the vertical pointing data, we think we can integrate that out. Um, in terms of the ZDR measurements themselves, that's another story. So if, you get, if you're raining over the radar, your ZDR measurements are, are affected, and I know there's a bigger variance in that. As for S-Pole, when I've never seen, looking vertically with S-Pole, I've seen this sinusoidal pattern when you look vertically into raindrops and rotate the radar. Phase array, that's a good question. It would certainly seem to me that as all of those components expand and move a little bit, that this, this would have to affect your uh, uh, ZDR pattern in some way. But that's, you know, that's, that's look needs to be looked at for sure. I mean, I just see, I just see a real can of worms in ZDR coming from those phase array systems. If they, if they can design something where they're just looking on boresight all the time, they have a chance. But if they start squ squinting off, there's a whole, no, another whole can of worms that they're, they're opening up there that'll be a difficult problem to solve. I mean, we, we're having a hard time with a center-fed parabolic dish, let alone with just, just a single look angle, and you're, you're looking at something that would have thousands of different look angles with a ZDR function of that look angle. So here's a question from a non-radar meteorologist. But um, so I can imagine that on different days you, because you have different temperatures, you get a difference in CDR of 0.1 or maybe even 0.2 on yeah. occasion. Yep. Uh, and if you look at Vivex uh, sort of habit recognition schemes and so on, how significant is That's that? That's a good question. That's a good question. And I didn't, I didn't say that, and I should have said that up front. So all of this depends upon the user's requirement. If if you if you don't care about ZDR, if it's better than half a dB, let's say, then you don't have to worry about that. Or if it's, or if, or, or if two tenths of a dB, you know, if that's going to be good, you you probably will veer out of that range. But by and large, maybe you can get away with that. But so, but if you want more accurate measurements, then you you need to account for that temperature effect. You, you know, one thing I'll say about the next right is that they are in domes and they could do a better job at temperature control and they could probably do away with the the most of this effect. But it's at least something that users of radar data should be aware of, owners of radar should be aware of, and they should document that and understand that effect. But you're right, it, it does, it, it, it's the requirements of the users. Maybe they don't need to have something calibrated to a tenth of a dB. Well, John, given that Next Red Rock funded this work for you, they're, they're very interested in it. Yep. And uh, what are they intending to do with the results, the very nice results that you've come up with here, especially in light of the fact that they, their radars all have radomes? Yeah, so they're, they're, one of the things I, I think they would like to do is do better temperature control. One of the big problems in, in calibrating uh, ZDR on those Next Red is that they use that um, hybrid phase shifter to go from V to H. And if they would have followed the recommender, recommendation of people that they had had made reports for them, they would have come up with a front end like we have in our system where you simply use mechanical waveguides. And you go clunk, H, clunk, V. Clean, good, good high quality data, rather than having a little motor as it changes, uh, you know, takes a minute to go from one polarization state to the other. And so they're thinking, I've heard talk about those guys um, getting rid of those and going to waveguide switches. You know, they don't have m money is a difficult thing for them. And then the other thing is, is they want to use the cross-polar power technique. And a lot of that reason I've been able to do that research is that they found that their antenna looking angle was very important. And going on to this question here, it works really well for S-Pole because of the fast alternating idea that we use. And so when you, you get two cross polar powers, they're separated by about one millisecond. So your scatterers haven't moved very much in those cross polar powers. You saw from that line, they're pretty much are the same, you know, they make a very, very, very highly correlated straight line when you, when you do that scatter plot. However, they don't have that, that capability and they can only broadcast H. And if they're lucky, they only can broadcast V and it takes 
at least a few seconds, even with a mechanical waveguide switch, it's going to take you some seconds to do that. And so with our system, you can use anything out there, including precipitation. But, with, but for um, the next rads, they have to use clutter targets. And so when you look at it with H polarization, you have to be sure you're looking at the dead same scatters with V polarization, which, this is my original point, is that the antenna pointing accuracy has to be very good. Well, it turns out the antenna pointing accuracy of those next rads is not quite up to snuff, and so I know that they have a, what do they call that, a change requisition or a change something in there to, to update their antenna controller to get, to get better you know, pointing angle accuracy. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, so, as I understand it, one of the main uses of the uh, ZDR is to be able to look at it in sort of an average uh, raindrop size. Uh, For so, rain rate estimates, that's right. You do you do something with that to get to get an idea of the mean axis ratio and right. some way shape. So, or form. how does the uncertainty translate into a change in in mean size? What, what kind that's of a good. That's a good question. I don't have that plot up there, but there is a plot in the in um, um, in Bringy and Chandra's book. You can help me out any time, Bringy, <laughs> where where they show the accuracy of ZDR and for a for an accuracy of a rain rate estimate. And I think it's it's um, if you want to get um, an accuracy. Of within either 20 or 25 percent of your rain rate estimator, then you have to calibrate ZDR to within a tenth of a dB. That plot shows that quite nicely, and that's that's a good point you made there. I, I should have that plot up here. When when you uh, ship the radar from one point to another, like going to Pecan, do you ship the antenna hole or do you take it? Oh, apart? we have so sections. It all it. Go, only goes back one way, and but you, you don't, you don't know. We, it, 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 for those <laughs> shape of the dish, that was about $13,000 to do that. I don't think anybody's going to give us $13,000 every time we set up that radar to measure that shape. So you, and so you the, could but, expect these curves but, to be different but, for, every, for every location that you put it, set it up. It, it should. It, it probably should be measured, but every time we set up that radar, those antenna patterns, a ZDR pattern especially, looks pretty much the same. And so, remarkably, it does not seem to be, you know, changing enough. At least using the shape of that ZDR antenna pattern, using that for a metric, it doesn't seem to change that much. So, how much it really, you know, we probably should have like Jonathan or Eric, somebody that that knows how those things lock into place and how much play there really is in there. But that's a good point because, gee whiz, that antenna is, goes back to the mid 1990s. So, when you said you measured the shape of the antenna, you said you did it exactly, which is a strange thing for know, a measurement guy bad. to say. It's exact, it's exact compared to another technique. Um, should I? Have you, have you tried to do that, or were you able to do that at different temperatures? No, we didn't. We, we didn't have any. At 2009, we, we weren't aware of that. We just did it with. I, I mean, it's, it's a pretty good measurement. You only have 1,400 points. So they had those 1,400 optical reflectors on there. The little circular glass balls. It's kind of cool. And you get a forklift up there, and you could you could have seen it on that plot. I can bring it back up if you're interested. So this so if this is your dish, this cherry picker goes around the complete outside, and he takes about 50 shots or so of the camera that you know just illuminates up on uh, uh, on these points. And then this data is then sent back down to his onboard computer in his van. He's driving around in the van, and by the time he got off in that that cherry picker, they had a parabolic fit to all of those points in there. And I, I have the report there. That it's a, a very, very accurate measurement, though, the way so they do the, that. And the, they final, the final thing was, you, I can see why you, you regard the, the uh, curve with changes in frequency as being cyclical. Um, it, it's like the whole antenna is getting bigger or smaller. But with temperature changes and with structural components in the back of the antenna, it doesn't have to elongate and shrink homogeneously, perfectly. So it, it's very it complicated, it absolutely. Could be very, it could be very different from that. Very difficult to, to, to predict that. And the only way to do it is probably, you know, like we did, exper experimentally. And you could, you could see that now, whether 
That's one thing we'd have very difficult time modeling because if we could, if, that would be nice if we could, you know, at a particular temperature, remeasure all that stuff and then give it to the modelers. Is you, when you're getting down to this this tight a detail, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, so are, to model are there that. Are radar techniques that you can use to scan across the face? Yeah, the there, there are these things uh, with, with a little ball on the end of a stick, and you can roll it around, and somehow. I think they, they, they emit uh, a beam or something that you can pick up. There, there are other ways to measure the shape of things, for sure. And how, how expensive or inexpensive those are, I don't know. OK, uh, let's have one more question. Yeah, just to follow up on, on Brant's point, um, just assuming for a moment that the antenna is expanding and current contracting uniformly, yeah. Um, can you just mess then with the frequency instead of worrying about recalibrating based on temperature? Just adjust the frequency based on temperature to wow. effectively compensate for the. Wow, that's that would be difficult. I think. I'm 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 not sure. I don't think that changing the frequency is is analogous completely to how that dish would expand and contract. And so the idea of the frequency things was twofold. One was to see how changes in frequency affects the ZDR pattern, because we were searching for good frequencies that we can use for our experiments. Because what we think we would like is to have that ZDR antenna pattern to be constant across there, instead of kind of looking like that number. And then uh, uh, I forgot now what, what the other point is I was going to make. Um, and, and the other was to vary the frequency as a pseudo for expansion and contraction. And so by seeing how sensitive it is to a change in frequency, we felt that it would be pretty sensitive also to changes in shape. And that's about, you know, that's quite a lot of this, I understand, but still it's a good indication that it's a, it's a fairly sensitive instrument in the sense that if you change the, the, uh, uh, the, the face center of that horn in relationship to the dish, or when you change the shape of the dish, that you indeed are going to change that ZDR pattern, because you do change those phase relationships that bounce off the dish and are launched off out there. So it, it, in that way, it makes sense, I think. I just want to say that's a nice bit of detective work. There is one more question. One more question. Um, do you have any back of the envelope calculation on the field? What is the critical size of the antenna dish where you would start seeing this effect? Is this, does it's, it take a, really, a dish? A, it should, we should do more, it would be an interesting do I mean, there are C-band radars. I assume yeah. WD is a C-band, so it is a. Well, we sh I showed you those measurements. So they're seeing temperature dependency in the, in the C-band, and whether that's exactly the expand. There are other, there are other components in that ray dome that do vary. Do you have a feel? But, well, what would well, be Well, what, what I would say is that as you change frequency, if you want to contain, continue to have a one degree beam width, the size of this. So if you get if you get higher in frequency, then your dishes get smaller and smaller. So you don't have so much expansion. But your wavelengths get smaller, and so you need less of a change. And so that it kind of scales. And so I would say that you, any radar you have out there, you you will you will see some kind of a temperature effect. I could almost guarantee that. I mean, Famous small, last words, huh? With a small enough radar, you could do a controlled experiment. Maybe. Well, maybe so. That's a that's a good point. OK, let's thank John again. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Mm.